Hello, hello, hello. Let's continue reading The Door in the Wall by Marguerite de Angeli. This is chapter 7. The next morning the weather cleared, and by the end of the fourth day the spires of Oxford appeared. Before long they crossed the Sherwell into the high street. Everywhere Robin looked, there were students walking about and talking on street corners. They filled the punts and barges that crowded the two rivers. They sprawled under the park trees, eating bread and cheese. But wherever they were, they talked and talked and talked. Most of the students were poor and were dressed in every sort of particolored parti -colored gown or tunic. It seems to me, said Robin, as if they try to see how outlandish they can make themselves look. <laughs> The travelers went up the high, then turned on past the Saxon Tower and the market cross to St. John's College, where they were received with courtesy and where they spent the night. Beyond Oxford, the country began to be more rolling. Sometimes the road led through forests, then again it ran beside the river, crossed a bridge, and went up through a village. Once they had to turn aside and allow a cavalcade, cavalcade of horsemen to pass. It swept by in a fine parade of shining mail, bright banners, and gaily ca mm -mm, ca mm, caparisoned horses. In their midst rode a lady with her attendants. Robin wished the lady had been his mother. Let me put my glasses on. That might help. Ooh, no, it doesn't. Boy, they're too strong. Okay. Where was his mother now? Did she know about him and where he was? Did she know that he walked with the help of crutches? They followed the cavalcade up the winding road to the top of the hill, where there was a sign announcing a fair of which would be. Excuse me. Where there was a sign announcing a fair at which would be. Beck. There will be jousting, said Robin. There will be dancing, said John, go in the wind. And there will be little praying, said Brother Luke. There will be no room at the end, so we must not linger long. Let us see a little of the fun, begged Robin. So they turned aside and spent some hours at the fair, tethering the horses near the gate, giving a penny to a lad for watching them. All the country people had come from miles around. They had brought cattle and sheep, dairy butter and cheese. Whatever had been their portion after giving what was due to the Lord of the manor. Lombards from Europe were there with goods from far off lands. There were silks and velvets from Italy and France laces from Flanders. Robin wanted to be everywhere at once. He wanted to watch the tournament, the bear baiting, the wrestling, and the racing. He wanted to taste all the food, the pigeon pies, the honey tarts, that suckling pig, and the apple in its mouth, with the apple in its mouth, and the jugged hare. He flitted from one booth to the other with Brother Luke after him. Finally, Brother Luke said, Haste, seen enough, lad? Forgive me. Hast seen enough, lad? It is a good way to the next hospice, they tell me, and we have two to three days' journey ahead of us. So come, my son. Let me see only the rest of the Punch and Judy then. agreed Robin, and I shall be willing, for never have I seen anything so funny. For that only then, said the friar, and went to find John, who had been playing tunes and carrying and earning a few extra farthings from the dancers. By night of that day, they reached an abbey set in a hollow. 
Its square tower stood above the trees in sign of welcome to the travelers, who were most grateful for the hospitality of the abbot. He told them of the bed, uh, mm -mm. he told them of the best road to their destination and of the deep wood through which they would pass. There was frost on the ground when they started out next day. They had been a week on their journey and according to the abbot's council, they had still two days or more to go. Great rolling hills began to appear and over them hung clouds filled with rain. And rain it did before the hour was out. Then when they had begun to enter the wood that embraced the hill, it slackened and the sun came out. Let us halt here for our midday food, said John, whose jerking was wet, whose jerkin was wet because his cloak had been left hanging out the window of the White Heart. Here I shall build a fire to warm us and dry our clothes. Let us hope we're not overtaken by marauding Welsh, said the friar hopefully, for we are at the border. We shall say that office to remind us in whose care we are. Mm -mm, let me read that again. For we are at the border. We shall say the office to remind us of, to remind us whose care we are here as well as everywhere. They knelt in the woods as if it had been a, care, a cathedral, as indeed it, it indeed looked to be. For the trees bare of leaves arched overhead in the very same way that the groined arches of stone swept up over high overhead in the Gothic churches. Maybe that is where the idea came from, thought Robin. The fire felt comforting and warm. There was no ale and only one withered apple left, but water flowed in the river hard by from which John filled the leather flagons. After they had eaten, John sang a ballad while he dried his clothes. When Robin asked if he, had, if he might try the harp, John showed him how to hold it and pluck the strings. But it was not so easy as it appeared. John promised to teach him. By all accounts, said Brother Luke, this forest goeth for miles, and it may well be that we shall not come out of it by nightfall. Now I remember this wood, said John, nodding his head, though it was but once I went through it. It is of great size, but there is a woodsman cottage, I recall, wherein, wherein we can shelter for the night. I found the woodman and his good wife, courteous and kindly folk, willing to share what they have. Let us be on our way, said Robin. Now, whoops, excuse me. Now that we are near our journey's end, I wish to see my godfather, Sir Peter de Lindsay. Thank you, he is a good man, as my father says, John go with the wind. Well, he want me now to stay with him. Oh, no, no. Excuse me. Think he is a good man? You think he is a good man, as my father says, John go with the wind? Will he want me now to stay with him? For how shall I be an esquire or even a page? Robin was thoughtful. It was well known in the country roundabout that he is a gracious master and noble knight, said John. His lady, too, is well loved for her goodness to the poor. Fear not, my son, the friar assured him. Thou'lt find kind friends in thy new home. All afternoon, the way continued through the forest, yet there was no sign of its coming to an end. The dusk began to fall, and the howl of the wolf sent shivers down Robin's spine. Still no woodsman hut appeared, and there was naught but forest trees and brush on every hand. 
Finally, when it was so dark they could hardly see the path, Robin pointed out a feeble light. That must be the place. Ah, sorry, forgive me. I went ahead of myself. Robin pointed out a feeble light. See, there, through the trees, he said. A small cottage. That must be the place. Ah, John sighed in relief. Ah, then I was not mistaken. It is the woodman's cottage where we shall lodge tonight. How welcome the hearth and fire will be, declared Brother Luke. Let us hope we shall be as welcome. By my faith, if we not welcome, if be not welcome, then the surf is an ingrate. <laughs> For when I passed this way before, I helped yon woodman bind up the wound he had got from a fallen axe. As I carried him on my back to the cot where the woman tended him, the woodcutter and his wife made them welcome, yes, and shared gladly what they had. The ale was well brewed, and there was peas porridge and bread for supper. Then John played the little harp and sang. The next morning, well refreshed, the three voyagers set out on the last leg of their journey. The weather was neither fair nor rainy, neither hot nor cold, but somewhere in between. As English weather is like be, like to be, said the friar. When true daylight arrived, they had come to the edge of the wood, and now the hills stood all about, being very high toward the north, where the Welsh mountains loomed in the blue distance. For the most part, the road lay low among the hills, winding in and out, following the river. A heavy mist hung over the valley, so thick it was like a white blanket, which parted only enough for the next step to be seen, then closed in again. When wayfarers were met, it was as if they had appeared by magic out of nowhere. Once where the wood was narrow, a group of peasants suddenly came out into the mist, out of the mist, and stopped to ask their way. Their speech was very strange to Robin, but John Go in the Wind seemed to know what they said, and he directed them in the same strange tongue. <laughs> They're Welsh, he explained, and have wandered out of their way in the fog. My mother was Welsh, so I know some of the words. There is much trouble with the Welsh among the border here, but these seemed like harmless folk. Late in the afternoon, a breeze suddenly sprang up. In a few moments, the mist lifted and the air cleared. Robin looked up in amazement, for there, rising high against the racing clouds, stood a town with the church tower and castle complete. It must be. It was Lindsay. Look, he cried. Look, there it is. We have arrived. Tis true, agreed John. Tis as I hoped. We have arrived before sundown and can enter the castle before the gate is closed. Now thanks be to him who guided us aright, said Brother Luke devoutly, blessing himself. <laughs> Lindsay, is it, tr is it surely, said John, for only Lindsay stands so on a mound ringed with hills like a pudding in a saucer. We've but across yon bridge, go up the hill and through the town gate, and we are there. From the market cross, tis but a step to the castle gate. It is a happy end to our journey. Beyond the town and castle lives my own mother. They crossed the bridge and started up the hill. Now he was so near to his destination, Robin dreaded the meeting of Sir Peter. 
What sort of welcome would he have, limping as he was on crutches? What sort of page could he be, having no free hands for service? Robin need not have been afraid. As soon as they had passed through the outer gate, a messenger went swiftly ahead of the travelers to announce them. The, drawbar the drawbridge was down and the gate opened to them without question and they were received in the great hall as if they had been emissaries of the king. Sir Peter was scarcely recovered from his wounds. He sat in a high-backed chair near the fire while Lady Constance sat at her embroidery frame with a small girl leaning against her knee. Nearly Nearby were her ladies and two little boys who romped with the hounds. While the travelers entered the hall, Lady Constance rose and drawing the children about her, stood beside Sir Peter to greet them. It is a true pleasure to welcome you into our household, Sir Peter, to Robin, not seeming to notice that Robin could not straighten. We are grateful to this good friar for his care of you and to John Go With The Wind, who is known to us. This is Lady Constance and our daughter, Allison. And these are my two sons, Henry and Richard. Lady Constance warmly, em <laughs> Lady Constance warmly embraced Robin, crutches and all. We have long awaited your com company, your coming, dear child. And now we are most happy that you have safely arrived. I shall make a sorrow page, my lady, said Robin, rutfully, ruefully. But I can sing and I can read a little. I can read a little, too, while the same time, mm -mm, let me, forgive me. I shall make a sorry page, my lady, said Robin, ruefully. But I can sing. And I can read a little to a little to while away the time for your lordship, he offered, and I can pen letters for you. Sir Peter kept Robin's hands in his and spoke directly to him. Each of us has his, pa his place in the world, he said. If we cannot serve in one way, there is always another. If we do what we're able, a door always opens to something else. There it was again, Robin thought, a door. He wondered whether Sir Peter meant the same thing that Brother Luke had intended. Each of the travelers was assigned to his own place. Robin was to have a chamber in his keep, in the keep. The friar was to be lodged in a little room over the chapel in the inter inner ward of the castle. And John Go With The Wind was given quarters over the outer entrance gate. Before leaving the hall, he asked a favor. By your leave, sir, he said, I would like to visit my old mother who lives not far away. But I shall stay here a while until my young master finds his way about. Now that he was, he was well received, Robin found everything about the Lindsay exciting and interesting. The view from the top of the keep where they went in the morning was breathtaking. I can see for miles in every direction, he said excitedly. Surely no enemy could attack without being seen by the watch, by the watch. Didst forget the fog, said John Go in the wind, who has accompanied who had accompanied him. You look yonder, said Adam, the bowman, who stood watch that day. 
See that tiny moving spot in the field? At first, Robin could not find anything that moved in the open field to which Adam pointed. Then he was just able to make out the figure of a shepherd and a flock of sheep. After a great deal of Adam's directing and pointing, he could see a woodcutter emerging from the trees by the river. By night or under cover of mist, said Adam, a whole army could creep upon hill and through forest without being seen. Tis from the north and west that we look for trouble. Lord Jocelyn is to the west, hath long coveted this domain. Lord Jocelyn to the west hath long coveted, coveted this domain. And Sir Hugh Fitzhugh to the north yonder, who is cousin to Sir Peter, hath a quarrel with him. But they could not take so strong a castle, surely, said Robin. We cannot be starved out, said Adam. From the other side of the tower, Robin could look down upon the town and the church roof and could see clearly how the church was shaped like a cross. He could see the roof of the market cross in the open square and the people walking about. He could see the bend of the river and the two bridges, one leading west and the one to the south where they had crossed yesterday. To the north, the ground fell straight away down to the river more than a hundred feet below. My mother's cottage is there, said John, pointing north, over the hill and into the next valley. Robin could see where the tower over the, of the, the tower of the village church showed above the trees. Beyond, he could see the manor house against a deep forest which crowned the hills far, far away. It is near to the village where you, where you church, where yon church tower stands. Is it near the village where yon church tower stands? Asked Robin. Aye, tis just there, this side of the church, a tidy bit of a house on the heath where she lives alone with her cat. There is a path all the way. If thou to call her upon her, she would bake thou, she would bake thee a bannock. Robin repeated the direction, but laughed at the thought of going all the way to make a bit to make a visit. Go you by that road to see leading up from the river here? he asked again. No, said John. For tis a long way round by Lethem Bridge. I go through the town and by the Drower's Road and across the ford beyond. It was more difficult for Robin to go the circular stair, to go down the circular stair from the top of the keep than it had been to go up. Each step was set on a center knoll and the steps fanned out from it. Robin had to keep, Robin had to keep to the outside wall to allow room for the crutches to spread far enough to bear his weight. John went ahead of him to catch him in case he should fall. I shall get the way of it soon, said Robin. Before the day was out, he found it easier. They had gone up and down, stair after stair, up to the watchtowers and the belfry of the chapel, to the kitchens and the, and the storerooms, to the armory and down to the dungeons. Then John took Robin to the stables to see the horses there, to see the horses, that is. There were dappled Percherons from France and Shire Geldings of tremendous size built to bear the weight of men and armor. There were lighter animals for hunting, hawkings and riding, and others still smaller, like the genet Robin had ridden. Robin thought the gray one looked like his father's favorite. 
how he wished he might ride it, going astride properly as he should. Would he ever again be able to mount a horse? Would he be able to practice in the tilting yard or go a hawking? Would he ever stand straight and tall? Last of all, they went to the workshop near the stables. There were yet bows. There were you bows. There the you bows were made and repaired. Staves for lances and pickstaffs were cut. Such small things as plates, cups, bowls, and platters were made by the turners in the town. Arrows were made by the Fletchers. It is here we shall make the little harp, said John. Can we make it soon? asked Robin. We shall begin tomorrow, if I can find the wood, promised John. As soon as Robin was settled in the household of the castle, he was taken in hand again by Brother Luke, who laid out a plan of study and recreation for him that would fit in with the duties assigned him as a page. Sir Peter had explained that he would expect Robin to attend to everything which it was possible, which it was possible for him to do. Part of each day was spent with Adam, the yeoman, shooting at a mark. Part of the day in studying Latin. Evenings after supper, the household servants, pages, craftsmen, and all those not in watch gathered about the fire in the great hall where pews, where Piers Nightingale or John told tales of sang ballads, told tales or sang ballads. Each day the friar took Robin down the long path to the river to swim. The water was cold as ice and swift flowing, but now Robin had learned to grit his teeth and plunge in. <laughs> it should have been one of his duties to serve as the high table, to serve at the high table where Sir Peter and Lady Constance sat with other members of the family and visiting nobles. But because it was so difficult for him to carry things, he was excused from that and was required only to see that his lady was well looked after, and the little boys were helped with the cutting of their meat and breaking of the bread for sopping. <laughs> One of the hounds that searched for bones among the straw litter learned to come to Robin for tidbits, seeming to know that he had found a special friend. <laughs> Robin was careful to find bones, just, I'm sorry, bones from the joint with juicy bits of meat still clinging to them. And soon he was Robin's best friend. He even, stepped, he even slept by Robin's bed instead of near the fire in the hall with the other dogs and, follow, and followed him everywhere. He came, no, his name was Diath because he had been brought from a town in Flanders of that name. Diath. <laughs> okay, that is the end of chapter seven of The Door in the Wall by Marguerite Day and Jelly. We'll see you in the next video.